The title of my talk is Does the blue sweater scene from the Devil Wars Prada actually mean anything? And if so, what? This talk will only make sense if you have, in fact, watched or remembered any element of the Devil Wears Prada. Have people seen the film The Devil Wears Prada? Yeah. Okay. The Devil Wears Prada, based on Lauren Weisberger's book about working at a fashion magazine, um, is really a film about things being taken seriously. So should Anne Hathaway's character, Andy, take her boss, the Anna Wintour-esque Miranda Priestly, seriously? Can Andy be taken seriously in the job considering she is clearly so unsuited to it? And when she starts to get into it, spoiler, and realizes that fashion is itself serious, will her boyfriend and her friends take her seriously? Or can fashion itself be taken seriously? The sweater is not just blue, it's not turquoise, it's actually cerulean. That is somewhat important to Miranda Priestly, AKA Anna Wintour. So can this color blue and the process by which it chose Andy, which is the insinuation, be taken seriously when she fished it out of some clearance bin somewhere? But what grabs me about that scene is kind of twofold. The first bit can be loosely framed around the concept of emergence, how something rises from the bottom up to deliver a greater meaning and also the concept of contagion, that something kind of takes off and we don't even know why. And the other bit is the concept of predestination. Who chose the sweater? Or did the sweater choose her? I'm gonna bring your minds way back to the junior search history syllabus <laughs> and something that always stuck with me, that word, predestination or as I learned it in school in Irish, rave chinunt, a translation meaning pre-fate. Predestination, as you all clearly remember, is uh, a doctrine about the will of God and the free will of the individual. So if God knows and influences everything, then how can a person make choices if their fate is predetermined? So during the Refor Reformation, initiated by Luther Martin and continued by John Calvin, <laughs> hashtag my Calvins. <laughs> that concept of predestination was challenged. So the paradox of free will, that whether we have free will or God does is something that rattled that period of rethinking theology. Do we choose the blue jumper? or does the blue jumper choose us? Does this make us lurch from that 16th century philosophy to an 18th century concept that Adam Smith wrote about, the invisible hand? But the real question is, what happened in between Oscar de la Renta choosing Cerulean himself and Andy wearing a jumper of that color? It's almost as if fashion itself at its highest end can predict what people will wear eventually at its lowest end with nobody in control in between. And in this way, it's as much about predestination as it is about prediction, or as the Irish translation clarifies it, it pre-fate. So if fashion knows about us, if there is a sort of predestination or predetermined element to the items that we pick, then what else is being chosen for us? What else learns from where it comes from to become almost through adaptive learning things we desire to do? So basically, where does predestination fit in with predictions? What happens in the in-between bit? That's what that scene is really about for me. So we're obsessed with predictions. Everyone is, from football to politics to whatever. But it's funny that predictions take as much from the past as they do from the future because we only really legitimize them in hindsight when they come true. But when it comes to the future, elements of predictions and oracles scatter so much of how we envisage the future. 
which for the most part in popular culture is envisaged through the medium of science fiction. The one. So back to the in-between. In the in-between, it is if these things that are chosen and that we choose go about learning about us, about our needs. We think we learn consciously, but actually a lot of our learning is not conscious at all. We do not know that it's happening within us, around us, or to us. Simple example of this are immune systems, right? They learn things. If they didn't, we would repeatedly get the same diseases over and over again instead of developing immunity towards them. So an antibody activates itself to neutralize the antigen of a virus and remembers to do that again and again, should it occur, like a plainclothes officer scanning the crowd, going into a football stadium looking for a hooligan. The body learns without consciousness. It remembers and it predicts. Cities learn that as well, even though we don't think they have consciousness, but they kind of learn it. They keep their shape, they gather, and they organize from the bottom up, as Stephen Johnson eloquently examined in his book, Emergence, which I recommend. He used the example of how silk weavers in Florence have congregated over hundreds and hundreds of years, yet stay in the same place, no matter the massive change that occurs around them, for no reason at all, apart from organizing and learning that that's the place for them. But when it comes to contemporary predictions in that great field of science fiction, of which I'm a big fan, there is perhaps no more astute recent illustration of this phenomenon in popular culture than the film Minority Report, a slight obsession of mine. So Minority Report is a reworking of, of a Philip K. Dick short story, and it's about free will and determinism. Quick recap, these guys. But something else about prediction happened in the making of this film. So Steven Spielberg was so adamant to get the prediction of the future in this film correct, that instead of just designing some random science fiction landscape for it, he assembled a crack team of predictors before filming began. So the architect Peter Calthorpe, novelist Douglas Copeland, Jaron Lanier, that computer scientist who's predicting how we're all fucked and wrote uh, You Are Not a Gadget, and other people, they were all converged in a think tank a year or so before filming started in California, and they created what they called the 2054 Bible. So their task was to come up with realistic technologies for the future, not just science fiction ones. In conceptualizing these technologies, they ended up predicting so many things while furnishing a film about prediction. Now, although some of the things they devised were already in train, they envisaged them in a way that felt very real, manifesting technologies that we now see as common, but this film was released to American cinemas 15 years ago. They came up with, amongst other things, gesture-based interfaces, self-driving cars, retina scanners for security, insect robots or weaponized police and military robots, targeted personal advertising, malleable electronic paper, and of course, the basis of the entire story, pre-crime, crime prediction. But in predicting how we act, like the jumper, what are the ethics of interventions in those predictions? In Minority Report, Philip K. Dick's version and Spielberg's version, that was the crux of the issue because it was about arresting people for crimes they were about to commit. On a day-to-day -day basis, we know that the internet services we use predict by tracking our past. They predict our choices through our choices. They're both Oscar de la Renta and the bargain bin where the blue sweater is picked up. And this is not just by showing us ads for cheap flights to New York after we've talked in Gchat to our mates about, I want to go to New York. So this brings me to contemporary predictors, the Ceruleans, the precogs right here and the murder predicting soup in Minority Report. And that is personal data. 
I'm going to leave that slide up there because I think it's sufficiently creepy enough and kind of fitting. So that personal data, we all know, is important for marketing. That's what we think the basis of all this is. In knowing what car you drive or clothing brands you like, the assumption is that people who buy similar things act in similar ways and make similar decisions. We act based on who we are, right? That's the baseline for that. Our personality drives our behavior and our choices. So getting into the tracking of this is kind of weird and creepy, but we collude, mostly in ignorance. Our internet use becomes the antibody, getting up to all sorts of things that we aren't necessarily conscious of. But this data is changing, as we know. It's moving from metrics to psychometrics. So an assessment of personality can be boiled down to an acronym called OCEAN, which stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Now, if we know those personality traits, we can get a good grasp of a person. Not just of her, their personality, though, but of how they react, what they're scared of, and crucially, what they're going to do. So how do you harvest this information? In theory, that would take forever, right? You'd need to you know, make these long kind of psychoanalytical you know, studies of people. Unless, unless you take into account that people hand away this data all the time on personality tests online, on things that are, what kind of person are you? What kind of film character are you? All of those things where we're giving away things about ourselves that aren't necessarily demographical, but about feeling. And this is highlighted in the work of, of Michael Kon Koninsky, who through assessing likes on Facebook, found it became possible to predict someone's sexuality, their religion, their political affiliations, and whether they smoked, the more likes he had from someone, from various things, the more he could predict who they actually were and how they were. So soon, about 10 years, well, seven, eight years ago, the psychometrics on Facebook likes became a better judge of a person than those person's acquaintances. And eventually, this data would accrue enough knowledge about a person that it surpassed what the person knew about themselves. So this learning that we're handing over is not being done consciously, and those accruing it are not necessarily doing it consciously either. Like the antibodies, like Andy picking the sweater, our phone knows when we move, our Alexa knows when we're home, Twitter knows when people are hungry, Spotify, through aggregating playlists, knows when we're sad. So who's interested in this data? not just those forecasting the success of a particular shade of blue gaining popularity across high street fashion, although I'm sure they are, but anyone interested in influencing our behavior. And what is the one important choice that each citizen can make every few years to change things that other people want to influence? A vote. Which brings me to a company that you've probably heard an awful lot about recently, which is Cambridge Analytica. So this is, I'm um, sure many of you know this, British company that has vast amounts of data on various populations, personality-based data, emotional data. Most of it is drawn from personality tests across social media and email. So if you have a psychological profile of a voter, and by analyzing people with similar profiles, you can predict that they'll make similar choices. So you can tailor a political message to that audience. And as many of you probably know, the two major campaigns that Cambridge Analytica was hired by were Leave.eu and the Brexit referendum and the presidential campaign of Donald Trump. Now some say their involvement is overstated or skewed, but even if it is, I think it's worth thinking about. Regardless of the impact they had, 
this is what can be done now. Because in the summer of 2016, when Donald Trump's canvassers were going to doors, they had an app that they already knew the political views of the person whose door they were knocking on. One of Cambridge Analytica's board members has done very well out of this. His name is Steve Bannon. So bluntly, targeted ads used to come down to clunky demographics. And if anyone has done kind of Facebook ads five years ago, you know about this. People under 25, women, people who live in the commuter belts. That's about who you are very basically, not about how you think, and certainly not about what you will do. Cambridge Analytica had a conference recently where they claimed to have built a model that predicts the personality of every single adult in, U in the US. You can buy that kind of data from everything you can think of, from loyalty cards, from Facebook surveys, and create personality profiles based on it. And then knowing those personalities and people's behaviors, they can then be targeted more effectively with tailored messages. And when someone knows us better than we know ourselves, they don't need to tell us what to do. They just need to nudge a little more to make sure that we do it. So, is the blue jumper picking Andy? Or is she picking the blue jumper? Or was, as Miranda Priestley said, the whole scheme just thought up by a few people in a room? <laughs>